The dot product of two vectors a and b is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle between them. It can be thought of as a measure of how aligned two vectors are in n-dimensional space. To calculate it, we take the sum of each component of vector a multiplied by the corresponding component of vector b. If we only knew the definition on the left, it wouldn't be obvious how to actually compute it component-wise given two vectors. And if we only knew the definition on the right, then it wouldn't immediately be clear that it has anything to do with magnitudes and angles. So why are these two definitions equivalent? If we draw two vectors in the plane a and b with coordinates a1, a2, and b1, b2 respectively, then we can express the length of the line segment connecting the endpoints of these two vectors in two different ways. Setting these equal to each other and simplifying, we see that our two expressions for the dot product are indeed equal in 2D space, and the same method generalizes to higher dimensions as well. We can use this knowledge to derive the formula for the determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix in a way that I think is very elegant. Given a 2x2 two two matrix, the determinant is equal to the signed area of the parallelogram spanned by the two column vectors a and b. The area is signed because if the two vectors cross each other like this, then the area becomes negative. We know that the area of a parallelogram is just base times height, so our determinant is equal to the magnitude of a times this signed height, which is just b sine theta. But sine theta is equal to cosine pi over 2 minus theta, and if we take the vector a and rotate it counterclockwise by pi over 2 radians, then its new angle to b is equal to pi over 2 minus theta, and we can just take the dot product of these two vectors to get our formula for the determinant. Like the dot product, the cross product has a geometric meaning and a method of computation that at first seem like they have little to do with one another. In 3D space, taking the cross product of two vectors a and b produces a third vector, which is perpendicular to both input vectors, and whose magnitude equals the area of the parallelogram which those vectors span. Additionally, the vectors a, b, and a cross b must be oriented similarly to the x, y, and z axes, which is sometimes referred to as the right-hand rule. And to calculate the cross product of two vectors from their components, we do this. When I first saw this, I was like, what the heck is going on? This is horrible. But there's actually a really nice geometric intuition behind this formula. Visualize two vectors, a and b, in 3D space, as well as their cross product. We're given that a cross b is perpendicular to a and b, with magnitude equal to the area of the parallelogram between them, and we want to use that to derive this expression. Because of the perpendicular nature of the cross product, if we look from this perspective, we can see that the angle between the ab plane and the xy plane is the same as the angle between the a cross b vector and the z axis. Now, if we simultaneously project the a cross b vector onto the z axis and the parallelogram onto the xy plane, then because the angles are equal, this transformation scales down the area of the parallelogram and the magnitude of the vector by the same factor. So we can deduce that the z component of a cross b is equal to the area of the parallelogram projected onto the xy plane. The coordinates of the projections of a and b are just the coordinates of a and b with the third term removed. And so the area of the projected parallelogram is equal to the determinant of the 2x2 two two matrix formed by those two column vectors. And so that is our z component. For this example, I've chosen a particularly nice set of vectors where both the z component of a cross b and the projected determinant are positive. But if you can convince yourself that this holds true regardless of the orientation of the vectors, then you're basically done since you can take advantage of the rotational symmetry of 3D space to make the exact same argument for projection onto the yz plane. And zx plane. And that finally gives us our finished formula for the cross product. Each of these components corresponds to the area of a projection of the parallelogram spanned by a and b onto the perpendicular coordinate plane, 
which makes sense since that projection scales the area by the same factor as taking each component scales the cross product's magnitude. Now let's take a closer look at the determinant in higher dimensions. The determinant of an n by n square matrix is equal to the signed volume of the n-dimensional parallelopipeds spanned by the n column vectors in the matrix. And I put volume in quotes because we're really talking about the n-dimensional analog of volume. In two dimensions, we were able to use that trick where we rotate the first vector counterclockwise by pi over 2 and dot it with the second vector. In three dimensions, there's an analogous trick where we cross the first two vectors and dot that with the third vector. But this strategy becomes difficult to generalize when we get to dimensions higher than 3. There's actually something really clever that we can do here, and it involves realizing that the determinant is multilinear with respect to its column vectors. Let's look at the determinant of a square matrix as a function of its column vectors. This function takes in all the vectors that span the n-dimensional parallelopiped and outputs its signed volume. Now, I claim that this determinant function is linear with respect to each individual input vector when all others are held constant. What this means is the following two things are true. First, when one of the vectors is multiplied by some constant, the resulting determinant is multiplied by that same constant. And we can see visually that doubling the length of one of the sides of a parallelepiped does indeed cause the volume to double. The second condition for linearity is a little more difficult. The sum of two determinants, identical in every way except for one of the vectors, is equal to the determinant calculated using the sum of those two vectors. Geometrically, the two-dimensional case looks like this. Even in just two dimensions, it's not obvious at first why this is true, but here's a clever argument you can make. In our example, the vector b is fixed, and we're taking its determinant with a and adding it to its determinant with z. We know that the area of a parallelogram is base times height, so taking b to be the base, we find that the area of the parallelogram is completely determined by, and directly proportional to, this perpendicular distance to the vector b. When we take two vectors and add them together, their perpendicular distances to b also get added, and so the area of the resulting parallelogram must be equal to the sum of the areas of our two original parallelograms. I invite you to think about how this argument can be extended to dimensions 3 and higher. Now, let's say you wanted to find the determinant of this matrix. Using what we've just discovered, we're able to take this determinant and split it into the sum of these three slightly simpler determinants. Now, for each of these, we can do the same thing, this time with respect to the second column and again for the third column. Zooming all the way back out, we see that we've split our determinant into 27 simpler determinants, representing all possible ways to choose one element from each column. But look at this. For any matrix with two numbers in the same row, two of the edges of the parallelopiped are overlapping, which means the parallelopiped is degenerate and the determinant is zero. So we can cross all of those out, leaving us with just these six determinants to evaluate. Again taking advantage of linearity, we can factor all of the numbers out like this. Now let's look at one of these matrices we're left with. The column vectors are 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. So the determinant of this matrix is just the volume of the unit cube, which is equal to 1. The question is whether it's positive 1 or negative 1. In three dimensions, you could figure this out by just imagining how the vectors are oriented in space and using the right-hand rule, but this becomes difficult for dimensions 4 and higher. We need to find a more general strategy for determining whether a unit cube is positively or negatively oriented. Well, if there's one thing we do know, it's that the determinant of the identity matrix, the transformation that represents doing nothing, is positive one. And another thing we know is that swapping any two columns flips the sign of the determinant. You can see this because swapping the position of two vectors must cause the parallelopiped to cross itself and switch orientation. So we know the identity matrix has positive determinant. Swapping these two vectors, we realize that this matrix has negative determinant. 
And swapping one more time, we see that the determinant of this matrix, which is what we originally wanted to figure out, must be positive. In general, being an even number of swaps away from the identity matrix implies the determinant is positive, and being an odd number of swaps away means it's negative. Doing this for all of our terms, we finally arrive at our familiar formula for the determinant of a 3x3 three three matrix. The entire process can be summarized like this. Say you have an n by n matrix that you want to find the determinant of. List out all possible ways to pick n elements of this matrix such that no two elements share a column and no two elements share a row. For each of these arrangements, take the product of all n elements and multiply by 1 or negative 1, depending on whether the number of column swaps needed to line up the elements on the diagonal is even or odd, respectively. Finally, add everything up, and you're done. The method we've just derived is called the Leibniz formula for determinants. Here's the equation taken directly from Wikipedia. S sub n represents the set of all permutations of the numbers 1 through n, so we're taking the sum over all of these possible arrangements. For each permutation sigma in S sub n, we're taking the product of all matrix elements in the ith column and the sigma ith row as i goes from 1 to n. In other words, we're choosing one element from each column according to the arrangement of numbers in sigma and multiplying them together. By doing this for all permutations in S sub n, we cover all possible ways to choose n elements such that no two share a row or column. For each of these, we multiply by the sign of the permutation, which is another way to say the evenness slash oddness of the number of swaps needed to get this arrangement back to its ordered state. Finally, we add them all up, giving us the determinant of our matrix. For large matrices, this method isn't as fast to carry out as other methods like Gaussian elimination, but understanding it gives you a really deep insight into the way these square matrices behave. There are so many amazing theorems that directly follow from this way of breaking down determinants, and I encourage you to think through how some of these facts are implied by what we've just discovered.